Buenas on half a day from Guam. You're listening to Memoir Pacifica, a podcast series exploring events, movements, and people in modern Micronesian history. I'm Tony Asios, the show's producer, and our anchor today is Dr. Evan Lay Espiritu Gandhi. She's an assistant professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. In this episode, Dr. Gandhi discusses Guam's role as the primary way station in the chaotic months immediately following the end of the Vietnam War. In fact, this month marks the 46th anniversary of the fall of Saigon and the beginning of the massive evacuation and resettlement effort known as Operation New Life. Let's begin. In Saigon, the tensions had reached a fever pitch. Heavy shelling at the airport destroys planes on the ground and American Marines are killed by rocket fire. We are seeing a great human tragedy as untold numbers of Vietnamese flee the North Vietnamese onslaught. With communist forces only a few miles from the center of Saigon, the order to evacuate is given. Throughout the war in Vietnam, the U.S. Air Force and Naval Base on Guam played a key role in supporting the American military intervention in Southeast Asia. But in April of 1975, as North Vietnamese forces advanced upon Saigon, it was clear that the war's end was fast approaching and that supporters of the American-backed regime who remained in South Vietnam would face brutal reprisals. Despite being located 2,500 miles away, this turn of events would have unexpected results for Guam. We have now decided on Guam as a staging area, and we are moving people directly from Saigon to Guam. Over the next four months, the tiny island of only 93,000 people would play a new and even more pivotal role in the conflict, this time in processing roughly 112,000 refugees, fleeing political persecution and the fall of their beloved homeland. Well, Operation New Life began at 3 a.m. in the morning when Secretary Kissinger called the governor of Guam, my husband, Ricky. We were both asleep. And I heard the phone ring, and uh, the security said it was a very important call. That's Madeline Bordalio, who was First Lady of Guam in 1975. And the secretary was asking the governor if Guam would receive the refugees that had just fled from Vietnam, and he was finding it difficult to get any other countries along the way to accept them. Initially, the U.S. cargo planes evacuating South Vietnamese refugees were supposed to land and unload at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. The U.S. had already identified as many as 600,000 South Vietnamese citizens as possible evacuees. This list included a broad mix of those most vulnerable to political retribution after the fall of Saigon, such as anti-communist politicians of the toppled Republic of Vietnam, high-ranking military officials, Catholics who had fled south in 1954, and individuals connected to the U.S. government, military, or embassy, as well as their families. For the frightened South Vietnamese civilians, the hardest part was the waiting. Many people said it was unnerving to be waiting for a ride to safety and to be hearing fighting all around you. However, the U.S. government was caught off guard by President Ferdinand Marcos's pronouncement that no more than 2,500 Vietnamese evacuees would be allowed in the Philippines at any one time. Unlike the sovereign country of the Philippines, Guam is an unincorporated territory of the United States with two major military bases. So Secretary of State Henry Kissinger called Governor Ricardo Bordalio in the middle of the night to ask if his island home could temporarily house the incoming evacuees. In his reply, Governor Bordalio invoked the Japanese occupation of Guam during World War II. So I remember very vividly what he said. He said, Mr. Secretary, Guam was liberated by the U.S. forces, in particular the Marines. Now it's our time to give back because of their generosity in liberating us from the uh, occupation. Joaquin Kin Perez was the youngest member of Governor Bordalio's cabinet and the commercial port director during Operation New Life. He passed away in October 2019. 
but I had the honor of interviewing him in 2016. Here he is explaining the governor's decision. Ricky is a survivor of World War II. So he knew firsthand about the misery of war. And so he just said, we got to open Guam up and we got to show our hospitality and try to take care of these people. An awful lot of our boys died in Vietnam. And in tribute to those soldiers, Ricky Berdalio felt it almost obligatory to offer refuge to those who survived and who ran away from the, the horrors down there. Although the governor quickly agreed to have Guam serve as the principal U.S. processing center for Vietnamese refugees, it would not be an easy task for the 212-square-mile island. With tens of thousands of desperate evacuees on their way by ship and plane, the U.S. military, local government agencies, and civic groups on Guam immediately mobilized to build the infrastructure to handle a massive influx of people. Overall, This first wave of refugees was more educated, politically connected, and multilingual than Vietnam's general population. And we're moving very rapidly. By tonight, we should have about uh, 9,000 people on the island there working very closely with the governor, who's been very cooperative. My grandmother, Ho Nhok Hoa Taylor, was one of the refugees who left Vietnam on April 27, 1975. At her side was her 12-year-old daughter, my mom. I have the friend, he sponsored me, and we, we come to Tân Sinh Nhất Air Force, and we go to military cargo airplane. They take us to warm in airplane, and no shit, nothing. We sit in the floor, everybody in the floor. Her experience resonates with that of Bianca Wing's father. Bianca is a teacher with the Guam Department of Education who grew up in a mixed Vietnamese Chamorro household in the village of Jigo. Chamorros are the indigenous people of Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands. My father and his family left Vietnam in April 1975, a few days before the fall of Saigon. My father's sister had married an American soldier and they had a family. They had left to Manila because they were evacuating because they knew that the fall was coming. And my father and my grandmother weren't sure if they were going to see anybody after that. They thought they would just be staying in Vietnam. But my auntie's husband came back and said to them, I have papers here and I can take you. I can sponsor you. So instead of going to Manila as originally planned, they ended up on Guam. But we come really nice when we come down the airplane and we have the long line. The lady and man standing there, say hi to us and each person have something to give us. Look like cigarette or uh, some little cookie, a candy, something like that. That's my grandmother again. You can hear her jade bracelets clinking together in the background. And after that, we take the bus and go to where we stay. And over there, they take care of us, breakfast, lunch, dinner. We eat in military style, but we comfortable. The Department of Defense initially calculated that a maximum of 13,000 refugees could be sheltered for a short period on Guam. But only four days into the operation, 20,000 refugees had already arrived. This was to be the second wave and the increasing tempo of evacuation in the face of a rapidly deteriorating situation. By May 15th, the number of refugees housed on Guam peaked at 50,430. That's an over 50% increase in the island's population at the time. The U.S. military set up nine camps at different sites to house the refugees. The largest, commonly called Tent City, was located at a Rodi point on Naval Base Guam. Tent City was hastily built atop an abandoned and overgrown World War II airstrip, which had to be cleared of hundreds of acres of brush. At its peak in 1975, that camp housed over 39,000 refugees. Here's Bianca again, describing her father's experience at a roadie point. I believe they landed in Anderson and they had to go down to the future site for Tent City. 
when they got there, they just decided to fall asleep because I believe it was like a five hour flight from Vietnam to Guam. When my dad woke up, he was amazed because the entire area was filled with tents. So it seemed like they were pitched overnight. We didn't know if we were going to keep up with the people coming in or not. First, they went up very, very slow. We might have put up uh, one tent in 30 minutes, let's say. And then uh, later on, they put up a tent every uh, 10 minutes. There was uh, approximately 2,980 tents, and there was approximately 50,000 people here. Another major camp was Tin City at Anderson Air Force Base. Tin City was, in essence, a group of corrugated metal buildings and temporary barracks. But for the local community, the most visible was Camp Assen, located at Assen Beach, alongside one of the main roads. Well, at the time, Assen, just on the inside of that road, I think there was at least 15 two-story barracks in there. And that was used during the Vietnam War for bringing soldiers back, and that's where they convalesced for a while. That's Gordon Ritter, who served as a caseworker with the Red Cross during Operation New Life. And then all of a sudden, this broke out, so they started using it that way. And then they had tents out in the fronts of that, and they were putting them in their barracks. Uh, So anybody going by could see it, but they were restricting who gets in. So we had our Red Cross information on so we could get in easily. But even with over 20,000 military personnel involved in the operation, more help and space were needed. Local doctors, nuns, priests, military dependents, college instructors, and students all heeded the call to volunteer. Private companies such as J&G Enterprises, Black Construction Company, Hawaiian Dredging Company, and the since-closed Tokyo Hotel also housed hundreds of refugees. 30 people volunteered to teach classes to over 2,000 children and adults. Nurses established baby care centers at the camps, which provided disposable diapers, baby formula, and toiletries. Still, the camps were overcrowded and their resources overwhelmed. As a result, during the peak months of May and June, over 15,000 refugees were diverted to Wake Island, another unincorporated U.S. territory in the Pacific. Health concerns were heightened as more and more refugees arrived. Roughly 15,000 came by ship on May 7th alone, followed by another 15,000 on May 12th. Here's how Ken Perez recalls the situation. The governor pulled a lot of stops out. Uh, we used the public health nurses. Public health actually set up uh, another tent city up by Two Lovers Point, and that was to, to clear the, uh, the initial evacuees, particularly the children, to make sure that they were immunized, they checked them for TB, they checked them for all kinds of Illness. Does anybody have yes. any diarrhea or vomiting? Okay, does anybody have any sores on their skin? Yeah. Are any of the uh, ladies pregnant? Uh, yes, at two. Uh, Do you know how many yeah, months pregnant she is? Uh, She's six months, right? The first batch of people that came out, they were like the higher ups. They had the money, they had the gold, uh, they had suitcases, they were like, were ready to be moved. And they were the first ones that came on the planes. Little by little, when they finally got to the average people, then they came with nothing but the clothes on their back. It was really hard for those people, and they didn't even have something to change into or wipe themselves down with. That was Vicki Ritter, the wife of Gordon Ritter, who we heard from before. Vicki, a Chamorro from Guam, was volunteering as a locator for the Red Cross when she and Gordon met. When they started appearing at the mouth of the harbor, we didn't know what to do. And I was called and said, you have to come up and see this. I went up on the ship and there was thousands of people on these ships. There were no sanitary facilities. It was really, really bad. So I negotiated with the Navy and I said, look, you're already setting up Tent City. Instead of letting these people land on Clamorous Island, Let me transport them by barge over to Naval Station and you set up the necessary public health facilities to be able to to bring them in. And you have to feed them. There was no food on those ships. And the voyage between here and Vietnam, some of those ships took 17 days. So they were in really, really bad shape. 
um, particularly the really big ships that, that were the only, the only thing they did was open up the cargo containers and put people in them. And put it this way, I don't think it was a, when I, what I saw, human beings should not be submitted to that. We sent them over to Naval Station where they sent them to the public health check. They were given new sets of clothes and they were assigned to a tent on Orodi Peninsula. But extremely crowded conditions and limited plumbing meant that serious public health concerns remained. Here again is Gordon Ritter. One of the biggest problems with the Rody Point was you had 40,000 people in tents and dealing with toilets that they built. We weren't ready for this. Guam was not ready for 40,000 people in one place in tents. It was, it was horrendous out there. I don't know how those people stood it on Rody Point, but I guess it's better than being in Saigon as it's falling. As the commercial port director during Operation New Life, part of Kin Paris's job was to work with the U.S. Navy to identify which of the incoming ships carrying Vietnamese evacuees were no longer seaworthy. Many vessels were intentionally sunk in the Marianas Trench. However, Paris recalls how one young captain refused to abandon her ship. One of them belonged to a young young lady, and she was captain. She captained on the ship from Vietnam to here. And when we tried to evacuate her from the ship, she refused to go because that ship was given to her by her parents. She tied herself to the mast, and when the, when the security tried to, to take her off, she opened up her dress, her jacket, and she had hand grenades tied around her. And right then I just, I gave the order, I want my men off of this ship until you, you guys in the military figure out what you're going to do with this young lady. They brought in a, a couple of interpreters and they finally talked her, you know, to, to come loose and to get that armament off of her. And they took her over to the camp. We explained to her why the ship was not seaworthy anymore. And I think the U.S. government agreed to compensate her something for destroying the vessel. There was another vessel that came in that we told him to just stay outside and, and wait until we could clear the harbor. Mm -hmm. I guess the captain was afraid that we would not permit him into the harbor. Mm -hmm. And so he just ran the harbor. He started a full head of steam out there and then start, mm -hmm. just ran straight in and didn't stop until he ran aground in the um, what we call the Delta area. And you had all of these tugboats and these security vessels running after him. And he didn't have any armaments. He just wanted to make sure that he got his people and the people that were on that ship to safety. That vessel we had to destroy. Another Chamorro who played a key role during Operation New Life was Monsignor David Kitagua. He passed away from complications with COVID-19 in September 2020 but I had the honor of interviewing him in 2016. In the first days of Operation New Life, Kitagua received orders from the local archbishop and the United States Catholic Conference in Washington, D.C. to set up a refugee resettlement office on Guam. And the camps, you know, we coordinate them. Those who want to go to the States will be processed to go to the States. Some of them will prefer to stay on Guam refer them to us and they won't release them until we find sponsors for them, until we find work for them, and until we, we have all those things, that's when they release them from the camp. Sometimes it's hard to find sponsors because there are quite, quite a lot of them, you know. So sometimes I, I just sponsor them, okay. you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, Sponsoring a family or a refugee, I mean, it's a, it's a risk because you are responsible for, for them. But it's, it's, it's fine with me as long as these people are all of the camp and can resettle uh, in the, the place, it's fine with me. According to Kin Perez, the sudden change in diet was one of the most difficult aspects of camp life for many of the refugees. One of the things that surprised us, they didn't like the kind of food that they were being given. You know, they didn't particularly care for bread and <laughs> corned beef and canned vegetables. When the refugees expressed their culinary preferences, the U.S. military worked to accommodate them. They asked for rice and soy sauce. 
uh, American rations don't necessarily provide for rice. And so the military people went over to the commissary and literally wiped out the rice supply. So that's all they wanted. But refugees also found ways to nourish themselves. They actually were permitted to go down to the beach mm-hmm. and they would fish, they would catch crabs mm-hmm. and they would bring them back up to the camp. And they were, they were permitted to have cooking facilities. But um, they went down to the beach and everything that they could, they thought there would, would be edible, they took. Operation New Life was a distressing time for the Vietnamese refugees who had fled their homeland without knowing if they'd ever be able to return. However, refugees like my grandmother gained strength from the sense of community in the camps and the warm hospitality of Guam's people. I don't know if you said or not, but just different in everybody the same way I am. <laughs> and that's why I feel comfortable. I don't feel lonesome. Like my grandmother and mother, the vast majority of the refugees stayed on Guam for only one or two weeks before flying to the continental U.S. for resettlement. Roughly 2,000, however, wanted to return to Vietnam. Some of the repatriates identified with the newly victorious communist government. Others were staunchly anti-communist, but felt compelled to return home to rebuild their country. Many of the repatriates, though, had been separated from their families during the fall of Saigon and simply wanted to reunite with their loved ones. Here's Vicki Ritter. You know, the people got separated in the chaos of leaving, in the panic. The families got separated. Kids came without parents. Uh, some were pretty young, but well, some of them, because they couldn't find any family here, they felt that maybe they didn't get out and they were still there, so a lot of them wanted to go back. There were more than 80 helicopters shuttling people out to the carriers. Everyone was searched before being allowed to join the other evacuees. Desperate Vietnamese remained at the embassy gate, hoping against hope that they too would be evacuated. But for them, there was to be no flight to safety. And just the thought of being separated from your family, not knowing where they were, whether they were killed or, you know, they could be somewhere in the States or some other place, um, that must have been pretty traumatic. Yeah, and then when you had the people in Saigon that got on the ships, a lot of them were just sort of gathered up in the crowd. They got on the ship, and then they got here. They couldn't find any families. So it wasn't all communist or or just military. It was just a, a big cross-section. There was a one kid who was about 12, and he went back. That He just couldn't find any of his family. The repatriates were in a difficult position because the U.S. didn't have diplomatic relations with Hanoi at this time. When the U.S. government balked at sending them back to Vietnam, the repatriates protested. Former First Lady Bordalio explains the situation. After a few months, the repatriates, they became very restless. They burned the barracks, portion of the barracks that asked them. Then they came down, they insisted on visiting with the governor. And they protested there day after day. And they did odd things. They pulled their nails out of, you know, their fingernails. And they were shouting and it was a real problem. The governor decided, what are we going to do with these? They want to go back. So he put in a call to Secretary Kissinger. And he said, Mr. Secretary, I have an idea. We can't think of anything else here. They want to go back. We've told them that it's very dangerous. They will be imprisoned or they will be killed. But it doesn't make any difference. They still want to go back. So he said, I have an idea, Mr. Secretary, and that is to the military has volunteered to outfit the largest boat there or ship, small ship. We're going to outfit it with uh, equipment from the other little boats. So Mr. Kissinger was silent and he said, Governor, I'll have to call you back. I'll check it out. So it wasn't 30 minutes later that Mr. Kissinger called the governor back and said, I want you to go ahead. I'll take that ship, send them back, but be sure you quiz them once more before they get on and tell them 
what to be expected once they get to Vietnam. I remember one older lady, she was a blue-eyed Vietnamese, and that made her different. She was one of the ones who were helping to sew the clothes. We would go out and get black and blue, typical pajama colored dark clothes that that's what Vietnamese would wear. And they were all getting outfits. So at least when they got back, they weren't wearing U.S. T-shirts and stuff like that. On October 17th, 1975, over 1,600 repatriates departed on the Vietnam Tung Thin, captained by Trung Den Dro, a former naval captain of the fallen Southern Republic of Vietnam. In her analysis of Guam's repatriate movement, historian Jana K. Lipman cautions against interpreting their demands to return to a newly unified Vietnam as a, quote, triumphant rejection of U.S. imperialism or a romanticized revolutionary victory, end quote. Indeed, despite the crew flying the Vietnamese communist flag and displaying a huge portrait of Ho Chi Minh, Vietnamese officials interpreted the repatriation initiative as an American scheme to sabotage Vietnam. Upon their return, most of the repatriates spent years imprisoned in re-education camps. By November of 1975, the once crowded camps were empty and the tents removed. Operation New Life was over. What was initially supposed to be a relatively small undertaking turned out to be one of the largest humanitarian operations of the 20th century. The critical role Guam played was not overlooked. In a letter dated May 15, 1975, President Gerald Ford commended Guamanians' quote, warm and outgoing response, end quote. He upheld them as a quote, outstanding example to other Americans and the rest of the world in meeting an international emergency, end quote. But in some ways, Operation New Life never truly ended on Guam, as roughly 4,000 of the refugees chose to make the island their home. They quickly became a vibrant part of the community. Many run prominent restaurants, grocery stores, nail salons, and small businesses, while coordinating with local Vietnam veterans groups to host events for Black April and Vietnamese New Year. Monsignor Kidigua, who received a Distinguished Humanitarian Award from the United States Catholic Conference for his work with the refugees, believed that Operation New Life had a positive impact on Guam. Oh yeah, it's, it's really, uh, it, it brings life to the people. It brings like an additional, um, you know, like culture to the island. It just uh, add to the uh, advancement of the, the island. Uh, it's a great story, great story, and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of it. Some refugees married local tomorrows. Here's Bianca Wing again, describing what it's like to grow up in a Vietnamese tomorrow household. Um, Christmas time and any type of holiday, it's always a mix of both cultures on the table. You definitely will have Vietnamese lumpia, fried lumpia, the fresh lumpia, but you'll also have red rice and chicken calaguin on the same table. I mean, it's a mix. It's a huge mix. Some mornings you wake up, you hear my dad playing his Vietnamese music. Some days you hear my mom playing some Johnny Sublime or Chamar music. So that's why it's, it's a really eclectic mix. Bianca's Vietnamese Chamorro family also helps us draw connections between Operation New Life and Guam's long history of colonization and militarization. To elaborate, Operation New Life was made possible by the U.S. military's long-term presence on Guam. Following World War II, the military seized indigenous Chamorro lands in order to construct Anderson Air Force Base and U.S. Naval Base Guam stolen land that was instrumental in housing the refugees. And for years, the U.S. military heavily recruited local Chamorros to fight in the Vietnam War. Going through UOG, going through university courses, and you hear about the history of Guam, the colonial history of Guam, you start to realize that there's certain things that were kind of amiss. So I started the decolonization conversation blog. I titled it such because I felt like I was someone who didn't really know the nuances of it, and I wanted to find out more. And while I'm personally grateful for the opportunities that Operation New Life afforded Vietnamese refugees, like my grandmother, mother, and Bianca's father, it is important to note that the U.S. military that facilitated the operation 
has greatly inhibited other visions of Guam's future, including decolonization. For example, Guam's public officials have pointed to the massive influx of Vietnamese refugees during Operation New Life, which was temporary, as evidence that Guam could accommodate the arrival of 2,500 Marines and their dependents from Okinawa, a more permanent military buildup to which many on the island object. Such narratives inadvertently pit Vietnamese refugees and their descendants against contemporary decolonization struggles on Guam. In contrast, folks like Bianca insist that Vietnamese Americans should also be a part of the decolonization conversation. Now that I'm older and I have a child of my own, decolonization for me is still a very relevant topic. Decolonization for me, and I'm sure for a bunch of people who are in this movement, it's not to say we're anti-American or anything like that. It's just to say we should correct a historical injustice. It's giving us the opportunity to voice out something, to make a choice, and take advantage of the opportunity that other people before us didn't have. Such are the complex political legacies of Operation New Life. That concludes our third episode of Memoir Specifica. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll subscribe to our podcast and share it on social media. You can learn more about Operation New Life and Dr. Evan Lay Espiritu Gandhi's forthcoming book, Archipelago of Resettlement, Vietnamese Refugee Settlers in Guam and Israel-Palestine. It'll be published by University of California Press, scheduled for release in spring 2022. Speaking of upcoming releases, Memoirs Pacifica will air its next episode in late May. Anchored by LJ Castro of Saipan, it will explore the negotiations, drafting, and signing of the Covenant Agreement between the Northern Mariana Islands and the United States. Meanwhile, if any of our listeners happen to have any old videos or photos related to Operation New Life, please get in touch. We'd love to take a look and possibly share them online. And even if you don't have any photos, but you have a story you'd like to share on Facebook or Twitter, we'd love to hear it. Type it up, send it. Until then, saina maase, and take care. Memoir Specifica is supported through grants from Humanities Guahan, the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities, and the National Endowment for the Humanities.